Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the CVCS podcast. This is Mr. Jasper, and I'm continuing today my series talking to CVCS school leaders about the podcast network and our vision for it at various levels of the school. I've so far spoken to head of schools Marcus Choi and elementary principal Marnie Day. I am here today with junior high principal Mr. Ryan Cluster. Thank Let's you go. for joining us today. Uh, welcome to the studio. It's uh, good to be here. First time recording in the studio, right? First time recording. I know that we canceled and rescheduled about seven times, <laughs> so I feel like I'm your white whale. Yeah. You've it, captured me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel honored. Uh, yes. I feel probably more honored than I should, but um, <laughs> yeah, welcome. Yeah, let's just get to it. I, I always like to start off just asking for people that don't know you that are listening, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us how you got into education and tell us how you ended up at CBCS. Yeah, well, thank you. So first of all, I'm not a native Californian. I grew up in the great state of Michigan, which is a wonderful state to be from, uh, but I'm very happy to be a Californian now. And I grew up in West Michigan in a very small town and went through Christian education my entire life. My parents were both teachers. My mom was a kindergarten teacher at a small private Christian school. She was actually my kindergarten teacher. Oh. And my dad taught in public school for 30 years uh, during like the glory days of public education (laughs) for him. And I always was immersed with educators around me. My parents' Mm -hmm. friends were all educators. We traveled together. Um, We were just always around it. And then so it was very natural for me to want to go into education. Absolutely. But really for me, it was my Mm -hmm. seventh and eighth grade junior high history teacher, Mr. Rowarda, shout out to Mr. Rowarda, um, who really inspired me and made me want to become a teacher. So I went to Calvin University, mm-hmm. Calvin College at the time, and got my bachelor's and my teaching credential. And then it came time to get a job. And <laughs> it was very difficult in 2005 to get a teaching job in Michigan. So after a lot of consideration, I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm open to moving out of state. But I had really two things that I wanted to be present when I moved. I wanted it to be warm, uh, <laughs> because Michigan is not warm, it's not. and I wanted it to be by the coast. So that was kind of like California yeah. or Florida, and <laughs> California called first. There you I go. was applying all over the place. And I got a job at Bethany Christian School in Sierra Madre, just outside of Pasadena, over the phone. Wow. Packed up my life into my Ford Explorer and drove across the country without a plan of where to stay, uh, where to live, (laughs) or anything. And I showed up at this new school and said, hey. Uh, And they said, how can we help you? And I said, well, I'm your new history teacher. And figured it out from there. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) And I thought that it would be a one year, get some experience, apply back home and move back kind of thing. But again, there was two things that happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, I started surfing, which captured my heart. (laughs) And then I met my wife, which of course really captured my heart. (laughs) And from then on, it was, we are going to stay in California. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. How'd you end up at CBCS? So that's a great story. We were at the ACSI convention not the one at the convention center is when it got moved to Friends Christian in Yorba Linda. Mm-hmm. And my wife and I were both teaching at the same school, so we attended together. We're sitting next to each other. And there's this little promo or thing that comes on the screen about this school in South Orange County. And I think it was Sean McDowell talking about um, some of the work that they were doing in apologetics. And it sounded really cool and dynamic. And it also happened to be by some of our favorite surf spots. There we go. <laughs> and this is Thanksgiving. And I leaned over to my wife and I said, man, that would be an incredible place to teach. Mm-hmm. Not really thinking about it. Sure. Eight weeks later, I was teaching at the school. Wow. So I made a mid-year switch um, and came down to teach history. And then shortly thereafter, was asked to take over the principalship for the junior high, which hadn't had its own leadership oh, prior really? to that. Wow. Yeah, There was for, this maybe upper school, lower school? So was for a while, the, the junior high was associated with the, high sc- with the elementary first, and that wasn't really working. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then it was associated with the high school, but that really wasn't working. So they came to me and said, hey, Ryan, would you <laughs> like to do both uh, at the same time? You could be a teacher 
and you could be an administrator. Best of both. What worlds. an opportunity. <laughs> what an opportunity. <laughs> and I said, yeah. So I did that for, I think, nine years. And this is my first year That's just being wild. the principal, wow. which is fantastic. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. One of the questions I've been asking everybody that comes through here on, on these introductory interviews is a question that actually comes from one of my classes. I show them the questions ahead of time. They had a chance to revise and add and whatever. Um, they want to know from each of our school leaders, uh, this is unrelated to the podcast network per se, but um, what is your idea of a perfect school and what does a perfect school look like? Well, the perfect school doesn't exist. Sure. So I hate to say that from the get-go. <laughs> Maybe in some utopian way, yeah. um, it's a dream. But really, I think the perfect school is the one that best serves um, its community in the context that it's mm. in. Mm -hmm. So the perfect school for one group or context may look one way. Uh, perfect school for another group or context may look completely different. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really important because things that we've been talking about in education with the whole machine to garden idea yes. is that schooling should not be a one size fits all operation. Mm -hmm. So when somebody has their ideal and then starts putting it on everybody, that's where we end up with that kind of machine like yeah. school. Whereas for CVCS, that's going to look different. It is, yeah. That's It's funny you mention that because the next question kind of naturally is like to introduce the audience to the junior high generally, not specifically the podcast network per se. What things are going on at the junior high here? And what are your emphases? What are our teachers working on and developing and, you know, trying in their classrooms in general. And I think Machine to Garden is a part of that. In, in fact, could you define that for us, for audience members that don't know what that means? Yeah, we'll get there. I think yeah. where I want to start is with the junior high team. Yes. Uh, because they are they're an incredible group of educators. And when you think about those junior high age, 7th uh, and 8th graders, it, a lot of people see that age group as a stepping stone to high school. Sure. Like I'm going to start in the junior high and then I'm going to become a high school teacher because that's, that's it's where like it's something at. to get through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But what we look for in junior high teachers are people who see this age group as their end goal. Like mm. this age group is so special. They have so many unique qualities. They're the most authentic people out there. Yes. <laughs> um, and there's complicated things that comes along with that. Yeah. But we want people who see this group as just incredibly special. And we've accumulated incredible teachers who focus on these students in a way that I've never seen before. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so what is going on at the junior high? What are teachers working on? And what is machine to garden? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, Mr. Walker is the, the man when it comes to machine to garden. But the idea is that much of our education system is set up in an early 20th, late 19th century structure. And, and we see it all over with um, rows of desks pointed at the front of the room. The teacher is the person who is conveying the information. The students are there to uh, memorize that and then spit it back out to the yeah. teachers and you will be assessed on that. Yeah. Um, but really, when you're going through your own education, I guess, or I could talk about my own education, after I was in my sophomore year of undergrad, I never really took a test. Huh. Almost everything I did was sure. collaboration, creating with other people, working in teams. And when you get into the real world, you almost don't take any tests. <laughs> you don't take any tests. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this idea that we're just teaching kids to take tests, that's somewhat antiquated. Sure. What they're really going to be doing is collaborating with others and working in teams. So we want to facilitate that. Yeah. So if you came to the junior high and walked into Mrs. Bond's class, they have something called Worldview Wednesday, mm -hmm. where they circle up in a group, they pick a hot topic yeah. right now that, that's in the world, and they discuss it from a biblical view, from their own personal view, from the world's view. And they do that under the guidance of a trained, uh, biblically-based <laughs> teacher, teacher who loves yeah. them and wants to share the truth of Jesus with them. Absolutely. Um, so sometimes parents hear the topics that we talk about, and they're like, you talk about that? in your school sure. at that grade level. And then we respond by saying, your kids are already talking about it. Mm -hmm. Do you want Google to teach them? Do you want the internet to teach right. them? Or do you want to be under the guidance of an awesome teacher? Yeah, that's so wonderful. So that's what you would see if you walked 
into Mrs. Bond's that. classroom. Yeah. Uh, if you walked into Mrs. Spencer's classroom or another history class, you might see students circled up working with primary documents, discussing the differences, or collaborating on a project together. Yeah. Those are the skills that we it's want wonderful. to build. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, if you walk into one of our math classes, yeah. you will see students, uh, even right now in the studio, I'm looking in at a yes, math right. class, and students are not all in their seats. They are at the board working together on problems That's right. the way you would in the real world. That's right. I love it. Uh, let's transition to kind of like the heart of this conversation, which is, uh, you know, the podcast network. How do you see the podcast network becoming more a part of our school? And maybe even you can speak specifically to the junior high. How do you see the junior high using and benefiting from having a podcast network? That's kind of the crux of this whole conversation, and we can splinter off in 100 directions from there. Yeah, it gets to the why of what we're doing. Yeah, and for sure. what we're doing is we're telling stories. Mm -hmm. Stories are the most compelling medium that we have. You look at whether it's TV shows, uh, movies, other podcasts out there, it's sharing stories between yeah. people. Go back to the Bible. What is the Bible? It's the story of God's people. That's right. It's not just a point by point uh, <laughs> yes. systematic theology piece <laughs> sure. that we read and we say, this is how it works. No, yeah. it's a story of God's people. It's messy, it's ugly, it's beautiful, it's all of these things packed into one glorious story. Right. So how do we convey interest? How do we convey our passions? How do we convey empathy? It's through story. So for the junior high, what does that look like coming out of a classroom or mm -hmm. off a playing field? It's conveying these wonderful passions that God has gifted us with in a meaningful way so that we can share it with other people. And that could be a sports season. Sure. We just captured the CIF championship with yeah, Mrs. Did. Bond and the volleyball team, and we had a big parade today. There's a story. That's right. Uh, this morning, we had Ian Kennedy in with Nora, his daughter, who's a seventh grade girl, and telling us a little bit about his story of capturing the World Series. <laughs> yeah. There's a story. But it's also students' work and making work that has been largely invisible in the classroom, yeah. tests or projects, sure. make them visible that can be shared or audio, I guess you of could course, say. Of course, of yeah. course. And shared with the rest of the community. And all of a sudden that work is given purpose. Yeah. Because prior to that, it's just something they turn in, it gets a grade, and they never think about it again. Mm -hmm. But this is something that is produced. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, and it can be shared not just in the immediate, but also down the line. That's right. One thing I've heard James Walker, the high school principal, say is the value of any assessment, and the podcast network falls into this, is like a real audience. Yes. And where the audience of a student's work is not simply the teacher, and then it goes away. But having a real audience, in this case, literally could be global, <laughs> yeah. um, is a huge stepping stone towards more authentic work for students to be doing, work for teachers to be assigning. You, you go to, and out, on down the line, right? How do you hope, like, as, as, as you and I talk to teachers, from sort of a school leadership perspective, how do you hope teachers at the junior high perceive the podcast network and utilize it and you know seek to make it a part of their workflow what does that look like for you yeah i think the yeah. first thing is getting teachers to just do it yes and that's with students too <laughs> yes yeah. i think we live in a world that comes with prepackaged products both uh, visually and and audio everything that we take is like perfectly manicured yeah f as a product and even social media accounts that students interact with daily, those are manicured perfectly. Yes. So they feel like maybe I can't access this thing because I, I'll mess up. I even got nervous coming in here. Sure. So how do we reduce that barrier and say, just let's make something let's try it. Yeah. and see what happens? Mm -hmm. Because the first time you shot a basketball, you probably missed. That's, <laughs> well, maybe you made it, but <laughs> no, a lot I... of people miss. And you've got to practice and do it over and over. But when we put ourselves and our voice and our ideas on the line, yeah. all of a sudden it's a little scary. It's so revealing. if we can remove that barrier, get kids involved, make something, mm -hmm. and then make it again, yeah. and then make it again, yeah. and then make it again, we're going to come up with some awesome stuff. I love stuff. that. I had a couple of junior hires in the studio yesterday, awesome. in fact. And I was helping them get set up and, you know, okay, you got your script, you've got your, you know, what you're going to say. Yeah, yeah, you know, we got it, we're ready. 
and uh, I go, okay, you know, here's how you record it. I'll be in the next room, whatever. And it took him probably 20 minutes to really get started <laughs> because inevitably they press record and they start talking and the other three people start giggling. Yep. <laughs> and it's just, you got to get that rhythm. You have to just kind of get, I guess, out of your own head. And seriously, as soon as they got going, there was not a problem and they, 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 they loved it. And so it's, I love what you said about like, just try it, like just jump in. And as something uh, Miss Day talked about in her episode too, of just kind of assuming that teachers will use it and going to teachers and saying, so what's your podcast going to be? You know, and just kind of like almost throwing that on them in a, in a funny way. And I think there's, there's precedent for this too in any creative endeavor. You may have heard this story about this study where they took art students hmm. and they took one class and said, we oh, want you yeah. to work the whole semester, the whole quarter, whatever the period it was, on this one piece of art, and we want you to get it dialed. Yeah. And then they took another class and said, just make a ton of them yeah. over and over. And when you're finished with one, do another one. Finish with one, do another one. Yeah. So it was about the production of it. And at the end of the semester, they compared their works. And the group that did the most work over and over they're the ones who nailed it. They're yeah. the ones who came out with a better product, not the group that was searching for perfection. Right. Which is really a yeah. analogy for life, too. It is, yeah. And that works perfectly for this, having now run the network for coming up on a couple months. Like, I can tell you that quantity breeds quality yes. and not the other way around. Yep. Absolutely. You listen to the first episodes that we've done in some of our feeds and uh, you can tell we're kind of getting our feet wet. And if we had spent any more time trying to get episode one right, we would have just kind of been spinning our wheels and burning time. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, by the, okay, by the time, you know, the athletics podcast is now at 10 plus episodes, like there's a rhythm, there's a routine. It sounds great. It's, you know, it's wonderful. So I can't emphasize, I can't agree and emphasize that uh, enough as, as well. And I think that goes to the core of one of our uh, CVCS values, and that mm -hmm. is risk-taking. Yeah, that's like, right. Get out there and do it. The best way to learn is through failure. Yeah. And we, are, we live in a very failure-averse society. We do. And that goes back to just seeing all these finished products, where yeah. in reality, that person failed 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 times before they hit that gem. So yeah. we want to encourage that type of failure mm -hmm. or at least the risk taking to get there. Yeah, and that feels like a unique barrier in some sense for junior hires and that, that age. For sure. As well. I'm glad you said that. My, It's funny you actually say that because my next question was going to be like, what do you see as being barriers and roadblocks for participation, whether it be teachers or students? Risk taking absolutely i think is is far and away probably number one and then i think it's just awareness sure uh, what do i do how do i do yeah is this real sure. uh, <laughs> can i go in a studio do we have a studio yeah so it's just making kids aware that this is an option and that it's a viable assessment deliverable yes because we're so locked into the idea that a bubble test is going to be the end all <laughs> Right. Um, but that's not real. <laughs> it's not. Whereas this is an actual thing that we can assess learning on. That's it's right. going to look different. It might involve a rubric or a conversation, but this is a real product that shows real learning. It does. One of the other questions that my class came up with and that wanted to ask everyone was that if, if you, Mr. Klostra, are the grade level that you now are the principal of, so let's say you are in seventh or eighth grade, and, uh -oh. and you hear... At that age, your school has a podcast network. What is your reaction to that? And between like scale of one to 10, what's your enthusiasm? What's your fear? What's, you know, all that kind of stuff. I think a seventh or eighth grade Ryan Klostra would have been ecstatic about this. They really? probably would have had to rip me out of the room. I uh, love that. Probably because I was self-centered and just wanted to <laughs> hear about myself. Um, but the fact that I could go in and, and create something yes. would have been phenomenal. I mean, as a kid, we created things on tape recorders. Right. Uh, but like the editability, the access, it was awful. 
But sure. now that fact that we can sit here and even in this podcast, yeah. how many times have you stopped the tape uh, already? Twice, actually, yeah. yeah. And we go back and then there's post and pre and there's all work that we can do to create a neat final product. Yep. Like that would have been absolutely exciting yeah. for me. I love that. That's awesome. Last question or two uh, as we wrap up here. For me, as the director of the podcast network, I love to kind of open myself up to this and say, first of all, do you have any questions for me in terms of how the network is going or how it's being run or what we're doing? And then kind of a follow-up to that, and you can kind of combine, answer both at the same time. Would you sort of like charge me with anything that as I lead this, be sure, you know, Joseph, you're doing this or you're you're being mindful of this or whatever. So that's kind of the, the two part. Let's start like, with closer. some fun ones. Are you yeah. able to track where people are listening? Uh, yes. You are? Ge- geographically, have, yeah. Have we had an international listener yes. yet? Yeah. Oh. We had one listener <laughs> From? in India. Nice. On like a Brewing with Jim episode. <laughs> I was going to say, because if we haven't, we need to like throw a mini party. There we go. Whenever that happens. So. <laughs> I think it's celebrating little milestones yeah. is going to be an exciting part That's of That's awesome. You know, speaking of little milestones, we passed, it was like the first week of November, if you're listening, that we uploaded our 50th total episode in the yes. network. And I think that that's an important milestone to focus on, Yeah. not on listenership sure. oh, or, yeah. or reach. It's how many products can we put out there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's a chance, like... We will probably get to 100 by Christmas. Unbelievable. It's wild. Okay, so I have yeah. some, some fun questions for you. Please, if hit you, me. If you could interview anyone who's alive today, oh my who would it be and why? I mean, well, Ryan Closter, I can take off the <laughs> list right now. That was the top. It took a while. It, we're here. <laughs> it did. Uh, for a while. That's actually, there's, there's some not joking in that, actually. <laughs> the weeks that oh, I've really, been trying to hunt you If you could you interview yeah. anybody alive today, who would it be? Wow. So I am, oh man, I have to choose between like almost fandoms in some sense. Like I'm a big Star Wars fan, maybe George Lucas. Okay. I'm a big baseball fan, maybe, you know, a a Clayton Kershaw, Mookie Betts, you know, kind of guy. It'd be fun to interview. I know Tim Keller just passed. He was actually one of the first names that came to my mind, but you know, some like really thoughtful, impactful theologian for me. Jamie, when I think Jamie Smith, maybe, when I think you know. about that question, yeah. I think about who's the most vexing mind to you that you would like oh to get goodness. into to understand a little bit more. So not just fandom, wow, although yeah, there yeah. could be crossover right, yeah. there, but who who do you just find fascinating that you would like to figure out how, how and why they tick? I would want to interview. I would probably want to try to find. This is so random. I'd probably want to try to interview like a CEO or like Tim Cook or like Sundar Pichai of Google, like yeah. just some like, like, what are you doing and like, what are you working on and why? And just dive into like the decision making process and the, the leadership prowess and the emphases that they have. You know what I mean? When you when you say like who's the most perplexing, you know, sure. that kind of that element to it, my mind jumps to literally like Tim Cook. Yeah. Because there's just so much there. Who, who out there that might not be on the radar of most people do you think would be a voice that you'd like to amplify, if you could interview wow, them, yeah. who you'd like to amplify and share their voice for the world? Um, not small questions. Not a small question at all. <laughs> the other school leaders are not asking me anything like this. <laughs> They're like, how many podcasts are you going to do a week? And I'm like, five. I don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, who to amplify, man? My genuine reaction to that question is like, yeah, so many people that I work with, so many people that I go to church with uh, that are doing cool things. This is actually like what we're doing right now is like yeah. a part of that. And, you know, if I could interview more of the teachers and and about the work that we're doing, colleagues from old schools, colleagues from my master's programs and my professors from from Dort University. Yeah, you went to Calvin, I went mm-hmm. to Dort. It's, for those, it's competitive. Like, We're the cooler version, but not Dutch as reformed. cool as we yeah. are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, 
everyone at Dort thinks like, oh, Calvin's our rival, and then everyone at Calvin is like, what's Dort? <laughs> so it's it's not quite a fair uh, fight. But um, anyway, um, yeah, I would want to elevate, I think, a lot of people that have inspired me personally. I think of old professors of mine. I think of uh, mentor teachers and uh, stuff like that. So I asked uh, that question because I think – for our students, they need to know that they can also ask that question or have that brilliant. question asked of them. If you could interview anybody, yeah. who would it be and why? Yeah. Because in the beginning, it might be like so-and-so because they're rich. And it's sure. like, that's cool. Yeah. I get it. And when you're a seventh grader or an eighth grader, that's what's on your mind. You're like, look yeah. at this person. They have this many followers or they make that much money. But then to think about why. Yeah. And then dig deeper on that. But who would you really want to interview? And you know what? That's possible. Yes. Like you can reach out to high profile people yeah. and they will respond to you just because they're going to be impressed that you're in seventh or eighth grade and you're asking important questions. That's absolutely. And true. if they say no, you're also going to learn through that process. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and you're off where you, you're, you have the same result as if you never would have asked. Exactly. <laughs> I love that question. Thank you for that. Yeah. What I else? Think, um, well, you know, historical figure. Oh, yeah. who would you interview? Bes- besides, Dead. besides Jesus, I know well, that's kind of the given. Alive Jesus. today, yeah. <laughs> you have to exclude Jesus because okay, that's okay. kind of the man. The, I mean, if you could do a podcast just on that, it would be what questions would you ask? Oh my Jesus? goodness! Like, if you're given five, what would you ask? Uh, but oh. take Jesus off the table. Who, yeah. Who else would you interview? <laughs> and we're assuming language is not a barrier. Just go for it. <laughs> we have Google. That would be a really awkward. Yeah. <laughs> We're here with Napoleon, and it, like it's just like silent. Um, no, uh, man, I would love to interview. I think of like some of our great presidents, Lincoln, Washington, Lincoln, you know, Roosevelt, other Roosevelt. <laughs> you know, like I mean, just uh, I feel like presidents would be an amazing category. I feel like. I'd be really intimidated to interview someone like Caesar, but like that would just kind of be fascinating. Yeah. Same with Napoleon. I think he falls in that category. Yo, hey, this is where I can name drop Tim Keller and yeah. just other, you know, C.S. Lewis. How yep. come on, you know, Tolkien and oh man. Who are the storytellers uh, today, either in podcast or media, that that inspire you? So, uh, in terms of like very specific storytellers, like fiction writers i am i i i'm head over heels for ted chang's short stories he has written uh at least two books uh, uh, that are collections of short stories one of his short stories is called the story of your life and it was the uh basis for the movie arrival um but each of these books um i went and grabbed them for my i paused the recording and went and grabbed them for my office real quick each of these is a collection of short stories that he's written and they all have something to do with like there's some elements of like science science fiction um you know mystery magic um but they're all really heartfelt stories and in terms of, again, when you just say pure storyteller, like he's the one that came to mind. I don't get to read much, which is an unfortunate. And we I certainly, both have small children. Exactly. I <laughs> yeah. And even when I do read, I tend to, for some reason, read a lot of like education and like history, you know. So in terms of reading pure fiction, it's, it's limited. But this is, these are some of my favorites um, that, I've, that I've read. I have one more question for you. Yeah. Um, I think that everybody pursues what they pursue for certain reasons. Mm-hmm. And there could be a million different reasons sure. for why people do that. But this podcast studio has been a passion for you. What do you think inspired you to pursue this um, with such dedication and passion? Man, it's kind of twofold. Um, and it's this perfect blend of uh, these, these two have worked together to culminate in this happening. Number one, I do as you've heard in the podcasts uh, that you've listened to so far, I do genuinely believe in the power that a podcast network or just that this medium or whatever can have for an educational institution. I am a big believer that access to these tools, to these workflows, and to this audience is deeply beneficial to literally any student and any teacher. I speak as an education major and as someone who's been in education my whole career. 
there's a genuine belief that this is beneficial for a number of reasons that we've discussed on multiple podcasts at this point. The second end of it that has filled in the picture and come together is that I am an avid podcast listener. I am subscribed to probably two dozen or more podcasts, and I don't listen to every single episode. I'll just kind of skip some when they come up, but I'm listening to podcasts every day. And when it comes to the technical side of it too, I'm just frankly good at it. And I I know what it takes. And I've done this before. And the workflow for me is, is natural and pretty easy and really fun, actually. And so it's this cool blend of knowing, again, that I know that this is beneficial. I know this is great for the school. And I know this is gonna help in like 100 different ways. But I also feel really uniquely equipped to be doing this for the school, not just with my knowledge of how podcasts work and the microphones and wires and editing, but specifically like the educational aspect of it and having been a teacher and having, you know, master's degrees in school leadership and teacher leadership and all that kind of stuff. Like I really do know how to like make this happen. And so for me, that's what's really inspired me is those two things kind of converging and the creation of the studio itself and the permission by you know, the school to sort of let, like, to let me run with this yeah. has just sort of, I feel like, unleashed me to, in fact, go ahead and run with it. <laughs> and I feel like a lot of things are happening out of that. And I think that that's a good analogy uh, for our students, too. When you mm-hmm. pursue your passion mm-hmm. um, and you you share that passion with others, good things are going to happen. Yeah. Feels that's like fair. a good place to end. It does. I love that. It feels like hopeful and like optimistic and it's great. Thank you, Mr. Closer, for for being here. This was a ton of fun. Uh, Any last words you want to share with our audience or just with the school community as we wrap up? Go Eagles. Go Eagles. I love it. (laughs) Thank you, Mr. Closer. Thank you. This episode has been a production of the Capistrano Valley Christian Schools Podcast Network. Be sure to check out, subscribe to, and leave a review of this show and the other shows on our network on your podcast player of choice. Doing so supports the school community in a multitude of ways. For more information about the CVCS Podcast Network or any of our other shows, check out cvcs.org or email podcasts at cvcs.org. On behalf of the whole network, this is Mr. Jasper saying thank you again for listening and stay tuned for more.